You're an alum, and also you're the chair of the organizing committee. So you're the, you're the man responsible for all of this, right? We have a good committee. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before we get into more about your business, I'm kind of curious, just in the morning so far, like what have people been saying to you that's top of mind for them? You know, these are some of the most elite CEOs that have gathered here, Wharton alums. I mean, what are they saying? Like, what's top of mind for them? Asia's growth still something that attracts people to come and invest in this part of the world or certainly study this part of the world. Um, U.S. is a bit of a question mark about uh, what's going on. And, uh, a small or a big question mark? I think it's quite a big question mark. I mean, the disengagement that might happen uh, in the global scene. Right. And uh, China is really taking on the, um, quite a lot of the um, vacuum that's created. Um, not quite expected a um, few years ago, but mm -hmm. um, seeing how this developed, um, encourage people to really s um, see how China might influence the world. Right. Um, I mean, it's been talked about for many years, the soft power of any countries right. in the global scene. And uh, looks like there is some shift in the, um, the relative uh, positions. Uh, Europe also you know, given Brexit and how that will change. Right. But, you know, the sh it's interesting you mentioned that the shift in power. And, you know, we're certainly seeing, uh, you know, in China uh, a, a greater role for China versus the U.S. Uh, is that something that's going to be advantageous for your business, seeing China take a greater role in this world? Oh, definitely. The growth that is, you know, even when people talk about slowing down, I mean, everyone's jealous about even that slower growth, you know, <laughs> right. six, seven percent. It's not, a, not something that you know, people can even try to achieve. Um, and so we think that that is the best place for us to expand beyond Hong Kong. We've been, you know, so we started in Hong Kong. Um, so not only because of the cultural uh, similarity, but you know, we certainly think that the growth will allow us to see increasing uh, consuming, uh, consumerism, right. uh, the growing middle class. Uh, especially in the few tier one cities um, that uh, is booming. I think one thing that a lot of people forget is that China's have opened up economically for several decades. It's not something that just happened you know, last month. And so there's already even you know, second generation wealth and um, yeah. you know, that's why people talk about asset management and all that. But we just had Tom Friedman on who said, you know, who said, yes, China has opened up and reformed, but has remained closed. What do you say to that? I think you know the closeness is also yeah you know, lessons learned from how other com uh, countries have opened up. Mm -hmm. um, not having so not national, to repeat those mistakes. Yeah, not having national champion and then opening it up might just weaken the, the whole country. Um, and there are good examples. I mean, Australia always have the four pillars for you know the uh, banks. You know, to make sure that they are national champions, right? And so, I mean, China is not too different from that. Yeah. And obviously, uh, as a, as foreign investors, a lot of co companies and countries said, please open up more. And I think it's a gradual process, and China's been doing that. Um, obviously, at a pace slightly slower than a lot of people wanted to. Right. But um, the direction is correct, uh, which is an important point. So the momentum is there. You know, speaking about directions, right? I mean, uh, it seems like property prices here in Hong Kong just keep going up, and at some point, uh, there's the concern. You know, are we going to see a crash here, and is it going to be uglier than what we saw, you know, back in '97 or even during the financial crisis? What, what is your assessment on that? Are we headed for a crash here? I think for all the global cities—New York, London, Hong Kong—there's a decoupling of how that affordability and, and, and the value should be measured. Um, you know, people from a lot of places will come to invest in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, so measuring Hong Kong uh, property price against uh, income of uh, average person in Hong Kong is no longer that relevant. It's mm. important. Uh, we still need to make sure that the uh, people ca in the street can actually afford uh, housing. So that is an issue that the country, uh, the government in Hong Kong, need to address. But at the same time, the property value, given low interest rate and 
I'm sure um, the chairman of the Fed uh, never think about Hong Kong when she adjusts um, interest rate. Right. And with such low interest rate, we, we are trading now at negative uh, um, you know, territory right now. Right. And inflation. So it is makes sense. I mean, it, it, it's following fundamentals, market. Yeah. It's okay. But but when I say market fundamentals, uh, I look at some of these numbers here and I see you know one parking lot, for instance, or one car space uh, selling for six hundred and sixty four thousand dollars I mean is that getting ridiculous and how long does that last and do you buy more and actually what, what's interesting is like you know as, as, uh, at the Warden School we have a few brilliant students and you can highlight that but we have also a lot of other students as well and, and properties is a little bit like that location 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 right some places deserve to have a very high value but it's not the average and I think there's still you know good affordable places in Hong Kong um, you know it does show some signs of you know stretching the limit um, but the economy is uh, with very low unemployment uh, with a lot of inbound investments um, still trading very well